we're beginning a series, uh, A Nation in Nosedive. The nation concerned is Israel in the Old Testament. The nosedive is a picture of a nation in steep decline. And we're going to see the course of Israel's uh, uh, decline in the, over the next few weeks and months here. Now, I, I'm a little bit of a nerd in some respects. One of the things I'm nerdish about is keeping records of things. And I've kept a record ever since I've been here, and even since before I came here, of the books of the Bible that are being preached in this church. And I can tell you that uh, since 2002, 22 years ago now, the book of Judges has never been preached on in this church. We have done Hebrews 11, and some of you will know that in Hebrews 11, some of the characters from Judges appear, the heroes of faith. Gideon, Barak, Samson, and a guy called Jephthah. And perhaps, maybe, when you were young in Sunday school, if you went to Sunday school, you might have heard of some of those names, and, and maybe you studied the, the life of Samson, or, or Barak, or, or, or Gideon, and you'll think that Judges is all about these great heroes of faith. It's a book of triumph and of victory, not a nosedive into disaster. It's a danger, isn't it, of picking our favourite verses in the Bible, or our favourite characters and studying those and missing out on what lies in between. This is why in this particular church, one of our principles of preaching is that we do consecutive exposition. Because you want to make sure that nothing is missed out. You don't get a distorted or unbalanced view of what God is saying. We want to take on board the whole counsel of God in the book of Judges. Nothing will be left out. Which is quite difficult, actually, because there are some things here I'd like to leave out and just do Samson and Gideon. This morning, the Bible reading and the sermon comes with a warning. There is some pretty grim stuff in the book of Judges. It's not as bad now as it actually is at the end, believe it or not. It's going to get worse. This nation ends up in moral, spiritual and civil chaos, and we are not spared some of the graphic details. The nation, of course, is Israel in the Old Testament, but we need to realise that God has brought us into his family, the New Israel, and we are part of that New Israel of the New Testament, and we are told this in the New Testament, everything written in the past was written to teach us. This book exists in the Old Testament, for our benefit this morning. Not just for Israel today or in the past, or just Israel in the Old Testament. It is for us this morning. Now, God's message is often very unpalatable, especially to the world out there, who would be horrified to read some of this stuff and imagine it should be even censored. You have people who suggest nowadays you should produce Bibles with areas like this, this text here just removed from it. And often that's the case in the church as well. There are churches also that would like to remove parts of the Old Testament and what it says. This morning may actually be a test for us whether we actually do believe the Old Testament and what it says. Whether we believe that the book of Judges, for instance, is as equally inspired as the book of Romans. If I ask you this morning to put your hands up, I won't ask you to do this. Do you believe that this book of Judges is as equally inspired as Romans? I wonder how many of you would... Put your hands on how many of you keep your hands down, perhaps. Or as equally inspired as the Gospel of Matthew. It's a question we need to ask ourselves if we as a church say we believe that the whole Bible is God's inspired word. One of the first things we need to deal with, of course, and one of the uh, biggest obstacles that people have, one of the biggest uh, uh, areas of conflict or controversy, is this matter of what has he done with the Canaanites? Because people will say that uh, it seems as if God is ordering genocide. The genocide of the Canaanites here. We need to recognise that the, uh, this is the background to not only the book of Judges, but actual fact, the background to the whole of the Old Testament after Genesis 12. Abraham was given a promise that his descendants would occupy this land. It would become the promised land. It would be their land and no one else's. That promise is repeated through Genesis, through Exodus, to Moses, and that promise becomes very clear uh, through Moses that it will involve the utter destruction of the Canaanite tribes. Listen to these instructions that God gave Moses to give to Israel. 
When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars. Smash their sacred stones. Cut down their Asherah poles and burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Can I call you? It, it is frightful to, to read it. But I want us to remember three things when we encounter those sort of instructions in the Old Testament. The first one is this. God is a judge. That is one of the ways he describes himself in the Bible. He has been a judge at least from Genesis chapter 2 when he says to Adam, you must not eat of that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. He is a judge pronouncing sentence on anyone who was to eat from the fruit of that tree. And Adam and Eve ate from that tree. So from that time onwards, God said, I am going to judge you. And they were excluded from the Garden of Eden. They were driven out. Just in fact, like the Canaanites were driven out of Canaan. <coughs> so God drove Adam and Eve out of paradise. They had no place in that land. They didn't belong there anymore. He was a judge at the time of the flood when he brought the floodwaters all over the world at that time. And uh, everyone was drowned in that, apart from, of course, Noah and his family. He was a judge at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, when he rained down fire and brimstone from heaven on that city. And it was destroyed completely, except for Lot and his family who escaped. <coughs> this time he is a judge of Canaan and of the Canaanites. And Israel is simply his instrument by which he is carrying out his judgment. God says, I will send my terror ahead of you. I will drive the Canaanites out. They are simply carrying out his instructions. Look at verse 17 of chapter 1 of Judges. You'll see here the men of Judah went with the Simeonites, their brothers, and attacked the Canaanites living in Zephath. And they totally destroyed the city. That is the same word that was used in Deuteronomy 7 that I read a few minutes ago. And look at your footnote there and it says, The Hebrew term refers to the irrevocable giving over of things or persons to the Lord, often by totally destroying them. So what Israel did was a sacred duty, a religious duty laid upon them. This was an offering to God of obedience to him. It was part of his judgment on these Canaanites. Some hundred years later, hundreds of years later, Israel herself was to be judged by God for her failure to keep these laws. It's not just for Israel, she too had to come under the judgeship, judgment of God. And of course at the end of the Bible, what we see here in Judges is going to be repeated but on a worldwide scale. This whole world will come under God's judgment. There will be no mercy for those people who have steadfastly refused to recognise his authority, who have been stubborn and rebellious. God is a judge in his very nature. Remember that. He has to judge. <coughs> Secondly, he is a just judge. Have a look at verse 7 here. When this uh, king... Uh, Adonai Bezek had been captured. Uh, he'd had his, uh, verse 6, it says when he was caught, he had his, uh, uh, his thumbs and his big toes cut off. Then he said, 
70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off have picked up scraps under my table. Now God has paid me back for what I did to them. They brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. Do you see that actually he is recognising justice in the way that he's been treated? He has been, he's received exactly what he dished out to his own enemies at an earlier time. Back in Genesis, when God promised to Abraham that he would inherit this land, he said it would be at least 400 years later. And the reason of that is this, because the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. So in other words, the Amorites, the Canaanites living at that time of Abraham, had 400 years, and in fact more than that, to turn from their deeds. But instead, they piled up their sins more and more. They refused to repent. They were stubborn and rebellious, and their time for judgment has now come. It is a just judgment because their sin has reached its full measure. In Leviticus 18, uh, Moses lists some of the sexual depravity. And if you want to know why they were being judged, read Leviticus 18 when you go home. In Deuteronomy 9, God says to Moses, It's not because you are good that I'm bringing winds to this land or righteous. It's because of the, of the wickedness of the people living there. I've decided their time is up. We're told in Deuteronomy 12 that those sins involved sacrificing their sons and daughters in the fire. The Canaanites practiced, among other things, those in Leviticus 18, they practiced child sacrifice, burning their own children. And God says also in Leviticus 18, when you come to that, you read that afterwards, he says, and if you behave the same way when you enter the land, expect the same sort of punishment. I'm a just judge, he says. When you get to the end of the Bible, we're told that the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, sexually immoral, the occultists, idolaters, liars, will all be thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, which is the second death. That is as ghastly and awful as what's happening here. But God is a just judge, and our sins will have to be paid for. Bear in mind also that he is a God of the same time of mercy. He commands Israel to love the foreigner in their midst. You might think that's a bit strange, having just ordered the Israel to wipe them out. But actually, those foreigners who were in the midst of Israel, who repented, turned to, in faith to God, could be saved. You might remember Rahab, who was a Canaanite, who expressed faith and was rescued and was found in the midst of Israel. Later on, Ruth. Here we hear of, in verse 12, Caleb. You've heard of him before. But did you know that Caleb, who belongs to the tribe of Judah, is descended from an, an Edomite. You can trace his descent back in other books of the Bible. He is from Esau. He is not from Jacob. He is a foreigner, or well, his family is a foreigner, if you like, in the midst of Israel. They've been incorporated over the years. But that is not his origins. Look at verse 16. The Kenites, the descendants of Moses' father-in-law. Do you remember who he was? Jethro? He was a Midianite. Where were they? They're among Israel. They went with the men of Judah to live among the people of the desert of Judah, in the Negev, near Arad. Israel is commanded in Deuteronomy to love the foreigner in their midst. God says to them that he is one who defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. And you, he says to the uh, Israelites, you are to love those who are aliens, foreigners, for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. He is a just judge, a merciful judge as well, because those who turn and repent, who are not hard-hearted, stubborn and rebellious, he does show mercy to them. But those who are hard-hearted, who refuse to repent after maybe hundreds or even thousands of years, he will judge them ruthlessly. That may be hard to accept. We're all aren't we, quite sentimental and soft-hearted at times, aren't we? But God says, no, I'm going to be completely consistent and sin has no place in the kingdom of God that I'm going to set up. Thirdly, this conquest of Canaan is a unique event in the history of the world. It is not repeatable in the same way that the flood only happened once. And after the flood, God said, never again will I do this to the world. Here is one occasion when God ordered Israel to occupy the land of Canaan. So it is not relevant to later periods of history, and especially not to today. 
Israel has no command, commandment today to wipe out the people living in this area. Benjamin Netanyahu, who is the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, quoted uh, 1 Samuel 15, uh, not actually this part, but the same sort of period of history, uh, not so long ago, uh, and quoted it as a, a, a mandate for him to destroy, kill, wipe out every single member of Hamas. It, the Bible is not to be used in that way uh, today. We'll look at how it should be used later on when we come to a conclusion and application. Now, if all of this is something which has caused you concerns or questions in your mind, do speak to me afterwards or do indeed talk to your home group leaders in the couple of weeks' time, not this Thursday, but Thursday after our next home groups. We'll be looking at Judges 1 and 2 and you can ask questions there to your home group leaders or indeed to me if uh, you find that easier uh, to come to me to ask the questions. So that's the first question then about uh, <coughs> the genocide of the Canaanites. <coughs> Second question if you look at uh, chapter 1 and, and, and verse 1, who will lead Israel after Joshua? I want you to remember that Israel was not even a nation when they were called out of Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. And God, if you like, formed them into a nation under the leadership of Moses. For 40 years, they followed Moses through the wilderness. When Moses died, Joshua took over. And for at least 20 years, Joshua has been defeating the Canaanites in, in that land. So for 60 years, this nation has known no leader other than Moses or Joshua. Now suddenly, Joshua is dead. Moses is long dead as well. How are they going to continue with no leader designated by God? Imagine this country in World War II, maybe 1940 or 1941. If Winston Churchill had dropped dead from a heart attack. What we've done, made peace with Hitler? Possibly. Because Churchill was the man, wasn't he, who actually was the figurehead for our resistance. He was the man we put our trust in. It was his words, his broadcasts, his courage that we followed. Imagine that sort of person being removed from the scene in the middle of the war. Joshua's been removed, he's died, and yet Canaan is still yet to be fully conquered. But look at this, verse 1. Who will go up first? Uh, who will be the first to go up and fight for us against the Canaanites? The Lord answered, Judah is to go up. I, I have given the land into their hands. The Lord is still with them, even though they have no figurehead of a leader. Uh, look at verse 4. When Judah attacked, the Lord gave the Canaanites and Perizzites into their hands, and they struck down 10,000 men at Bezek. Look at verse 19. The Lord was with the men of Judah. He was with them. And then verse 22. The northern tribes, the house of Joseph, that's the northern part of, of Israel, uh, attacked Bethel. And the Lord was with them. So though they haven't got a figurehead, the Lord is quite clear that he'll be with them and he will help them to victory. The promise is unchanged. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I swore to give to your forefathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. You may not have Moses. You may not have Joshua. More important than that, you have got me, he says, and I'm never going to break my covenant with you. I promise to bring you into this land and to give this land. If you will trust me and my promises, it will happen. Note also uh, that there's a theme of unity here as well. In, in verse 3, we see here that the men of Judah said to the Simeonites, their, 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 their brothers, come up with us into the territory allotted to us. There, there are 12 tribes, aren't there? And they're cooperating together here. Working together, uh, go back to that chapter uh, 1 and verse uh, 22. The house of Joseph, that would be all the northern tribes together. You see, if they work together as one people, though they are different tribes, they can achieve what God is going to give to them. It can be done. God will lead Israel after Joshua if they will trust him and his promises. Second question is this. Will Israel be obedient 
to God's command. Here is the very heart isn't it, of this matter. Will they be obedient to the command? Will they enter the land, which they happened under Joshua? They defeated, they broken the back probably of the uh, Canaanite armies, but now they have to take possession. Those little corners of Canaan where the, 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 the Jebusites are, are holding out, or, or the Perizzites, or the Amorites. Yes, at first they do, don't they? The southern tribes in particular, Judah and Simeon, we've seen in verse 4 how they attacked the Canaanites, and they, the Lord gave them into their hands. They struck down 10,000 men at Bezek in verse 4. Uh, you see in verse 8, men of Judah attacked Jerusalem and took it also. They put the city to the sword and set it on fire. Verse 10 to 13, they advanced against the Canaanites living in Hebron and defeated uh, Sheshai, Ahiman and Talmai. Uh, then they advanced against the people living in Debir, and, uh, and Othniel also uh, uh, took this town. Verse 17, then the men of Judah went with the Simeonites, their brothers, and attacked the Canaanites living in Zephath, and totally destroyed the city. So it's all good news up to that point. They are being obedient, but then we come to verse 19. The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, and here's the first negative note. But they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had iron chariots. Well, God has promised them that he would them the whole way. The problem wasn't that they couldn't, actually, but they wouldn't. They have held back. They have, in some way, decided that they're not going to take these, uh, uh, this, these planes. It's too much hard work. And then that uh, picture of disobedience continues. Verse 21, the Benjamites failed to dislodge the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. They, they defeated them once, but it comes to occupying it, and that little remnant that's holding out there, that they, they failed to do that. To this day, the Jebusites live there with the Benjamites, we are told. Verse 25. Uh, they, uh, they, they take this uh, city, uh, Bethel, but they do it by uh, having a man show them the way into the city, and then they say it spares him. And the man uh, and his family went off to the land of the Hittites where he built a city and called it Luz, which is its name to this day. They compromised what God had said. The man was allowed to go his way, and within a, a few years, he had built a whole city, uh, and later on God will refer to this as one of the thorns that's going to be in the side of the Israelites. Verse 27 to verse 36 is a catalogue of failure. We didn't go through the whole lot again, but notice towards the end there, actually, it's almost like a role reversal. Verse 34, the Amorites confined the Danites. So at first they were actually pushing the uh, Canaanites back. And the Kenites were being tolerated to live in little uh, corners of the land. But now, in verse 34, the Amorites confined the Danites to the hill country, not allowing them to come down into the plain. You see how the pendulum is switching. It's almost like the Kenites now have the upper hand uh, for a while. God was with them. He allowed them to grow stronger. So it says there in verse 35, the Amorites were determined also to hold out in Mount Heres, Aijalon, and Shalbim. But when the power of the house of Joseph increased, they too were pressed into forced labour. So God was with them and gave them the power, but they chose to put these people into forced labour rather than to destroy them completely, which was the command. Now you might think that forced labour is a good compromise. Actually, they're still in charge, the Israelites run the country, and they've got some free servants uh, who will work for them. You have the illusion of being in charge and being victorious and having all the plaudits given to you and having some servants. But actually, the key thing is you have not obeyed what God has ordered you to do. And so in chapter 2, we have the verdict from the Lord. The angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I brought you up out of Egypt, led you into the land that I swore to give to your forefathers, I won't ever break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? Now the angel of the Lord is a, a figure of speech that probably indicates the Lord himself. God himself, he didn't appear, we can't look at God's face, so he comes in the form, if you like, of an angel, what we call a theophany an appearance of God on this earth in a way that we can relate to. But God himself is speaking to the Israelites and saying, giving them that question, you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? Why? What do you think their answer would have been? 
well, we, we forgot your command. Or maybe it would have been, well, we were tempted to take the easy life. It seems easier to have the hill country and let these people go their own way on, on the plains. Or maybe we simply don't fear you very much. We don't think you're serious when we say these things. And we can make our own rules and live according to them rather than to what you have commanded us. Verse 3, chapter 2. Now therefore I tell you that I will not drive them out before you. They will be thorns in your sides and their gods will be a snare to you. That idea of a snare, a see spoke earlier about the idols, yes it will come back to haunt them. Because these idols will take root. And if you, if you read Isaiah and Jeremiah and some of the prophets at the time when Israel itself was judged, it's these very idols that will come back. And of uh, the reason why God judges Israel, because of the idols in the land that have taken root and have taken over, in fact, the, uh, the worship of Israel. The seeds of future disaster for Israel are here in Judges. Paul says to the Corinthians, we're doing Corinthians aren't we, before Christmas, remember Corinthians? He says to them in chapter 5 of, of 1 Corinthians, don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast. That's what Israel is told to do here, isn't it? Get rid of the old yeast. That you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are, he says to the Christians in Corinth. Same principle, isn't it, that God is asking of the Corinthians as indeed of the uh, Israelites here. In response, in, in verse 4, we see the angel of the Lord, when the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud, and they called that place Bukim. The footnote says there that it means weepers. There they offered sacrifices to the Lord. Israel is weeping, it appears repentant. Is it real? Is it real repentance? We ask ourselves, we'll find out, won't we, in the chapters to come. Or is it just regret? Is it just remorse? Matthew Henry, who's a well-known Bible commentator <coughs> from a few centuries back, says this, Many are melted under the words that harden again before they are cast into a new mould. Mm. Think about that. They are melted under the words but then harden again before they are cast into a new mould. When we are melted, it's to be made a new creation, made a new creature. Um, we'll talk about that in just a few moments. But it's quite possible to have this sort of repentance, to be weeping even, but for it not to be at all real. Let's come to an application. What does this all mean for us? God loves people who are 100% who are wholehearted in their obedience to him. 100%ers. That's why I think we uh, see here the mention of people like, uh, well, the tribe of Judah and Simeon at the very beginning and how they went for it, how they took hold of the land and believed the promises and, uh, and did what they were told, particularly that verse uh, 17, when they totally destroyed the city. They carried out their religious duty to God. That's why he's pleased with Othniel. And with Caleb and Aksa, uh, verses uh, 12, to, uh, uh, 12 to 15, 12 to 16 in fact. Because here are three examples of people, uh, two men, Caleb and Othniel and Aksa, uh, people in Judah who are determined to take hold of their inheritance, who go for it if you like. Caleb appeared earlier in Numbers, remember he was the one who was a spy in the land. And came back and said, yes we can take hold of the land. And ten of the spies said, no it's too hard. And God said, no. My servant Caleb has got a different spirit in him. He is one who follows me wholeheartedly, says God. That's the sort of person that God is looking for. Men and women of faith. That's why he's so pleased with Jesus. Here is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him, he said, because Jesus was a hundred percenter. He was wholehearted. When it came to the crunch in that garden, he said, not my will, but yours be done. That is 100%, isn't it? Saying, I know this is difficult. I know, I don't, but my, my stomach turns at this. As perhaps your stomach turns, some of these things that Israel was asked to do. Jesus was asked to go to the cross. And his stomach turned to that thought. But nevertheless, your will, not mine. He's 110%, isn't he? Determined to do what his father asks. And he is the one, we said earlier, with the children, when the children were here, 
who by his death has paid the penalty for our rebellion, for our disobedience. And the covenant is that he puts a new spirit into our lives. If we are born again, if we are a new mold, if we've come to repentance, it's important that it's evidenced by the Holy Spirit. Because that is God's promise to us. The Holy Spirit will be poured into our lives that we can have new desires. Whereas before, if we're honest, all of us are not 100%ers by nature. We all fall short. We are all disobedient. We're all actually subject to that law of death that we read about earlier when the children were here. We don't follow his command to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. But that is what God is saying. I'll put into your hearts a new desire to follow me, to have a zero tolerance policy towards sin in our lives. So in Mark chapter 9, uh, Jesus speaks about uh, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot leads you into sin, then cut it off. It's better to enter hell with one foot than to, with two hands or two feet, go into hell, he says. If your eye offends you, if what you're watching out on the screen or the TV or anywhere else, if that offends you, pluck it out. He's not saying literally pluck your eye out. He's saying be ruthless. Turn the TV off. Stop buying the, uh, those magazines. Go, don't go into that, den, that, uh, that gambling parlour, whatever it is you might be thinking or tempted to do. Be ruthless with sin, he says. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, Put to death, therefore. Now, isn't that interesting? The same language being used over the Canaanites. Paul uses the Christians. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. The judgment of God is going to fall on all those people who hold those idols. Have you thrown them over? Are they now out of your life? Do you know that you have been washed clean by what Christ did on the cross, by his blood, and that you are going to be spared that fate? If you are, then you are like the new Israel. You are going to enter the kingdom of God. And you will find there a situation very similar to Judges. What did Jesus say? As Jesus, whose name of course is Joshua in the Old Testament, as he departed to go with his father, what did he say to the the disciples? I am with you, even to the end of the age. You see? The same words that God spoke here to the Israelites, as they go into the promised land, without Joshua, he speaks to the church today. Jesus Christ has been raised in the dead. And we are without his physical presence here on earth. But God says, Jesus says, I am with you even to the ends of the age. I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is the covenant we have. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Does that echo in your heart? Are you a hundred percent of this morning? You say, I am for that. I want to enter into that kingdom. Be part of that people. And take possession of all that God wants to make me to have. I want to be someone who has a zero tolerance policy towards sin in my life. I want to get rid of every little corner where it happens. Those little niches where sin holds out. And it's determined like the Canaanites to resist the spirit of God. Is that what you want in your life? If it isn't, maybe you've got to get to that point where you weep like the Israelites here. And, and confess your sin. But make sure you don't harm before you've been cast into a new mould. And they become the new creation that God wants his people to be in the New Testament. Just bow our heads.